Um, okay, so hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gal, and first of all, I want to thank the organizers. It's just been a day, but it's been super interesting. Uh, today, I want to tell you about this work, Fair Preference Informed Fairness. This is a recent uh, collaboration with both Michael and Alexandra, which are here, and uh, Guy Rothblum from Weizmann. Uh, good. So kind of the outline to this talk is hopefully Alexandra's talk from yesterday has gotten you kind of sufficiently worried about uh, issues of discrimination and targeted advertising. So I want to kind of follow up on that. And I'll, I'll kind of start by discussing what individual fairness looks like in this setting. Um, and basically my main point is going to be that it is somehow kind of insufficient. Uh, and I'll present our suggestion, which we call Preference Informed Individual Fairness, an extension of individual fairness for this setting. Um, and I'll discuss some of its properties, so kind of the connection to kind of more preference-based definitions from the envy freeness, from the uh, fair division literature, and kind of how do you do efficient optimization. Um, and I want to try and leave kind of a couple of minutes for the discussion at the end. I think it touches on kind of some interesting questions that we mentioned today and yesterday. Okay, good. So I'll start with kind of a warm-up example for, for what individual fairness is. So this is kind of a very toy example in which suppose we have this binary classification task where an individual is mapped onto this binary outcome. So say loan approved or loan denied. And suppose that kind of individuals come in one of two types. So either they're credit worthy, uh, which I'll denote with green, or they're not credit worthy, which I'll denote with red. Uh, and now let's take a look at kind of two scenarios. So the first scenario, we have uh, a credit-worthy individual. This is the first individual, and they're approved the loan. And the second, and the second person is not a credit-worthy individual, and they're denied the loan. Okay, so we have two individuals which are, which are getting different outcomes, right? But we don't think of this as kind of discrimination, right? Uh, the first person, you know, they may be bummed out because they're not getting the loan, but it's not unfair. Okay, the second scenario, on the other hand, we have two individuals which are both credit worthy, yet one is approved the loan and the other is denied the loan. Okay, so that's kind of, they're similar with respect to the task at hand, yet they're getting different treatment. So that seems kind of problematic. Okay, so that's exactly the types of evils that individual fairness sets out to prevent. So formally, uh, we're going to be talking about probabilistic classifiers, right? So these are mappings from the input space to a distribution over the outcome space. And we're going to say that such a classifier is individually fair if basically for any two individuals, this constraint holds. Uh, which, what does it mean is that if two individuals are similar with respect to this task-specific metric, lowercase d, then their outcome distributions should be similar. Okay, so essentially in this example, the metric was, you know, are they both credit worthy or not? And the constraint was that if they're both credit worthy, then they should be getting kind of both accepted, or granted the loan or not. Um, good. So how does this look like in, in the context of targeted advertising? So now we don't have just this binary outcome, but we have kind of multiple outcomes, which is, you know, which ad is this person going to be shown? Uh, and if you think about it, it's not that clear uh, what a single task-specific metric here would even look like, right? So kind of this was addressed by this uh, Dworkin and Elvento paper uh, earlier this year. They called this setting the multiple task setting. And basically what they assume is kind of each of the outcomes, they think of it as a separate task, and then it makes sense to think of a separate metric for each one of the outcomes. So kind of think of the first ad, you know, being an ad for shampoo. We have a metric for which two individuals are similar with respect to this ad, and so on. Okay, so what does individual fairness look like in this context? So this is, uh, they defined it to be multiple task individual fairness. Basically the same constraint from before, just simultaneously for each one of the outcomes. Okay, so kind of think, you know, if two individuals are similar with respect to one of the ads, then they should be seeing that ad with similar probabilities, okay? So that makes sense. Um, and there are a couple of challenges in how you would actually implement this thing, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but kind of the main challenge is obviously, you know, where do you get, how do you get your hands on these metrics? And the second, this is covered in the Dworkin-Vento paper, is the fact that kind of 
naive composition fails, okay? So I don't want to spend too long on it, but basically it's not enough for each of the advertisers separately to kind of behave in a way that, that is individually fair with respect to their ad. This won't necessarily compose into a fair solution. So these are good and important challenges, but kind of the perspective I want to take for this talk is kind of taking a step back and actually asking, you know, putting aside these issues, is this actually the solution concept that we're after for this problem? Okay, and kind of the, you know, spoiler, the answer is going to be that not quite. Um, so to see why the answer is not quite, let's kind of revisit this, uh, the warm-up example that we had before. So remember we had uh, two individuals, both credit worthy, so similar with respect to this task, and they were getting different treatment. This was a violation of individual fairness, and that was kind of in accordance with our you know, intuition for th that this is unfair. Uh, so how does this example kind of translate to this new setting? Um, so now suppose you know, we have a couple of ads. The first is the shampoo ad, and the final is the loan ad. So suppose we have, again, these two individuals. They are similar with respect to the loan ad. The first person is seeing the loan ad, and the second person is seeing a different ad, say a shampoo ad. Okay, so for exactly the same reason as before, this is a violation of the notion of multiple task individual fairness, right? But if you actually look at it, you know, kind of this seemed a lot, the first example seemed a lot like discrimination. This doesn't seem kind of necessarily bad or evil, right? So if you think about it a little bit, what's the difference between these two examples? So I want to argue that the difference is in the individual's preferences over the outcome space. Okay, so to see this point, kind of in the binary loan example, presumably everyone who's applied to get the loan wants the loan, right? That's the good outcome. So denying a person of this good outcome is not fair. Okay, on the other hand, here we don't necessarily know anything about kind of the ads that people want to see. And in particular, it makes perfect sense for two individuals to be credit worthy but for one of them to kind of not be interested in the loan ad or just prefer another ad. Um, is this clear? Okay. Uh, good. So basically I've made the point that kind of individual fairness as is can sometimes be too restrictive. Okay, and actually the easiest kind of examples to, to see this is the fact that the allocation in which every person actually gets their favorite outcome is not necessarily individually fair. <coughs> um, okay, and before I'm gonna kind of get to our proposal, I do wanna mention kind of a naive solution. So one thing, you know, looking back at, uh, at this example, you might say, well, you know, uh, the first person and the second person, yes, they're similar with respect to this loan ad, but the fact that they have different preferences maybe should render them as not similar. Okay, so what this kind of suggests is that maybe you could actually incorporate the preferences directly into the metric and then stay with the same definition of individual fairness that we had before. So formally, this would look like, you know, you could define kind of a metric that says that two individuals are similar only if they're similar with respect to the metric and also with respect to their preferences for these ads. Um, so I don't have a lot of time, kind of this is, it's a good approach, but it can also be used to kind of discriminate. So it's not the, we don't want to use this uh, definition. So putting all these uh, observations together, our kind of main point is that this does call for a further study of what fairness means in the presence of these possibly diverse preferences over the outcome space. Um, good, so this won't be too technical, but I do want to kind of remind uh, the setup. So we're thinking about allocations, which are mappings from the space of individuals to distribution over the outcome space. Uh, so I'll use pi of i to kind of denote the outcome distribution over ads that person i receives. Um, and since we're going to be talking about preferences, I need to say something about how we're going to model these preferences. So most generally, what I want to think about is just every individual's, every individual having this reflexive and binary uh, relation over the outcome space, the possible distributions that they can get. Okay, so if I prefers an outcome P over an outcome Q, I'll use this notation. Okay, and kind of this doesn't assume a lot. We'll see later that 
in order to kind of have efficient algorithms, we'll need to assume something more about these preferences. Uh, okay, good. So kind of to illustrate this point graphically, so we have this set of all the possible allocations. And within it, there's this kind of smaller subset of all the individually fair allocations. And I've argued that this doesn't kind of sufficiently capture all the allocations that we think of as being kosher. Okay, and in particular, there's this very nice allocation in which everyone receives their favorite outcome, which is outside. Okay, so what we kind of want to nail down is, you know, this set of really all the allocations that we think of as fair. And kind of the challenge is that, you know, we're going to have, we'll have kind of different types of deviations from individual fairness, and how do we say which deviations are okay and which deviations count as discrimination. <laughs> so that's what I want to try and formalize. Uh, good. So the guiding principle to kind of formalize this is to say that allocations that deviate from individual fairness will be considered okay as long as these deviations are in line with the individual's preferences. Okay, so let's revisit kind of the example that we had before. So intuitively, I want to build up to the idea that if the second person prefers the shampoo ad, then I want to say that this outcome is fair. Okay, and I want a definition that, that supports this. So the idea is going to be, let's look at the, the second person with respect to the first person, right? So if I would have insisted on individual fairness in this context, the second person has to see the loan ad, right? Because they're similar to another person who's seeing the loan ad. So what I want to argue is that this allocation is okay because I'm giving the second person something that they prefer over the individually fair allocation. Um, okay, so I think the intuition is really simple. Kind of, I'll give the actual definition, uh, which is a bit cumbersome, but uh, I think it's natural. So we're going to say that an allocation satisfies this notion of multiple task preference informed fairness. Basically, for every individual I and for every other individual J, there exists this other allocation, which I'll denote with pi superscript j of i. Okay, think of this as the fictitious allocation that I'm comparing to. So this should satisfy two things. So first of all, this allocation should be individually fair with respect to j's allocation. So this is just the same constraint that I had before. And the second is that i needs to prefer their current allocation, this is pi of i, over this fictitious allocation. Okay, so this, again, just to formalize the intuition that kind of for every person with respect to every other person, I'm, if I'm deviating from the individually fair allocation, it's only to give them something that they prefer even more. And just sort of an important point is that you're, you're allowing each of us to pick a different IF reference point exactly. with respect to each other individual. Yeah. So it's not that we all have to prefer the current allocation over a particular IF reference point. But exactly. It's safe to say we prefer over some. Yeah, so there exists some fictitious allocation, which is both individually fair and that I prefer my current outcome to. Okay. Can you, I mean, we could do a bunch of other things with quantifiers here. Do yeah. you have time to talk at all about why this one and not the other ones? Uh, I think we can talk about it. Uh, like, I don't have a kind of a very good answer. I think this is something that we're, we're kind of happy with. It's sufficiently expressive and also gives the similar types of protections that individual fairness kind of in spirit gives. Well, does this guarantee, let's say, you can divide my population to groups, uh, green and blue people? Does this stop me from giving the green people always their most preferred outcome, uh, as long as the blue people don't like that outcome? Basically. So, okay, right? so like I, I, don't, I don't ever give the blue people what they want. The blue people don't like what the green people want, and I always give what the green people what they want. So it, we need to assume something about who's similar to who. So in this example, kind of, I don't, you didn't specify that. Um, there's a separate question uh, of kind of, you know, the fairness of the outcome space itself, uh, which could also kind of be relevant here. So I'll talk about it in the end. But kind of, you know, if the, if upfront all the outcomes are the outcomes that one half of the population likes best, then this doesn't kind of address this. Um, but okay, that we can, yeah. right. 
That intuition is correct. Okay. Alone. Okay. And may, but maybe like if that's true, but like individual, if that's true, then maybe they're not actually so similar. Individual fairness would re would say that the allocation where all everybody got the green people's favorite allocation yeah. is perfectly fair because right. everyone is being treated similarly. Right. Yeah. So okay. so this is only it's less restrictive. But uh, uh, if I understood correctly, Aloni is asking something in the other direction. Can you take advantage of that less restrictiveness to do something that you might think is unfair? Like yeah, like am I allowed to deviate in, from the individually fair allocation only when it prefers the green people, essentially? Can I be unfair in that way? So in, I, I think that in the example that you gave, you know, the answer is that no, because the ones that are, if I'm deviating from, you know, giving the good outcome to everyone, and now for half of the population I'm giving a different outcome, then I'm only allowed to do this if this half of the population prefers this outcome. If they don't prefer it, then the answer would be that no. Um, there, there are two assumptions. There is an assumption that we know preferences, and I would be very interested in how the technologies that try to mine those preferences impact the preferences. Um, that comes to the second assumption that preferences are something that is given, that is out there. Well, I think the whole problem starts with how come that some people prefer a, a shampoo to a loan. So the solution starts at the end when all the Choice architectures have been determined and in a way also feeds back into them because they're reinforced. But maybe that's not an issue you can solve here, right? So I, I'll say something about this okay. at the end, Great. so kind of yeah. hold that thought. Um, okay, good. So I do want to kind of discuss the relationship between this definition that I just gave and kind of, you know, this other literature on unfair division, which has a lot of fairness definitions that are kind of inherently preference-based. Um, so I'll focus on envy freeness, kind of this is the most clo closely related one, which basically says that kind of, you know, in the context of dividing this cake to individuals, that no individual prefers another individual's outcome. Okay, so kind of everyone likes their part of the cake the best. And formally in the notation that we have set up, this means that for every individual I and for every other individual J, Individual I prefers their allocation pi of I over pi of J. Um, okay, so kind of get graphically going back to this illustration, right now this uh, the set of envy free allocation kind of by definition includes this allocation in which everyone receives their favorite outcome. Uh, I want to argue, however, that it's also too restrictive. Okay, and kind of the easiest way to see this is in the case that everyone has identical preferences over the outcome space. So think kind of the binary loan example. What Envy Freeness essentially says is, you know, everyone should receive the loan with the same rate. Okay, so that's kind of not the direction that we want to go to. And essentially, the, the problem is that Envy Freeness, you know, coming from this literature on fair division, kind of assumes that everyone is equally deserving. Okay, but really that's not the context that we think of, of fairness in the context of machine learning, which is, you know, there are like these bummers. So this is the first example that I had with, you know, the second person not receiving the loan, but that wasn't unfair. That was a bummer for them. So I want to differentiate between bummers and discrimination, and envy freeness on itself doesn't really do this. Um, okay, and kind of one nice perspective is to actually look at this definition as kind of being in between both of these notions of individual fairness and envy freeness. Uh, kind of capturing somehow the best of both of these worlds. So formally, we can actually show that preference-informed fairness is a relaxation of both these definitions. So I'll, it's a very kind of one-line argument, so I want to give it. So basically, I want to show that if I start with both an individually fair allocation and an envy-free allocation, then this allocation satisfies preference-informed fairness. So I have to show these two, uh, these two things. So let me start with individual fairness. So in this case, I'm going to take the fictitious allocation, pi j of i, to just be i's current allocation. Okay, so now if I look at the first constraint, that's just the definition of individual fairness. So that holds. And the second constraint now is i prefers pi of i over pi of i. And since this is weak preferences, that just holds. 
Okay, and now for, for NV Finis, let's do exactly the same, but this time taking the fictitious allocation to be J's allocation. Okay, so now the first constraint is the one that holds kind of trivially, right? The distance, you know, assuming this is kind of a, a metric, then the distance between pi of J and pi of J is zero, and the, the lowercase d is between zero and one. And the second constraint, which is that I prefers pi of i over pi of j, that's exactly the definition of NV freeness. Okay, so that's kind of a very simple argument. And I won't mention it, but you can actually show that uh, you know, this notion of <coughs> preference informed fairness is equivalent to kind of a variant of NV freeness, which we call metric NV freeness. And basically, the idea of metric NV freeness is kind of the same NV freeness constraint for every i and every j but up to this factor of the distance between i and j. Okay, so the way to think about this is that if the metric specifies that two individuals are different, then that would essentially kind of lift the NV freeness constraint off of that pair. Okay, so that's, I think, kind of bridges, you know, between this very nice notion and the context that we're thinking about. Um, good, so I want to quickly say something about optimization. So, right, kind of going back to the targeted advertising world, you know, we might think of, you know, Facebook as kind of optimizing their own objective, but we want to introduce this constraint. So, we're interested in problems of the, you know, of the form kind of minimizing some convex objective subject to the allocation satisfying preference informed fairness. And, yeah, this is when the preferences are known, and I'll get back to it. Um, so I want to show that kind of this can be done efficiently, and the important thing to note here is that if I want to talk about efficient algorithms, I have to you know start assuming something more about the preferences, because otherwise you know this kind of outcome space delta of c it's like it's exponential on its own, so I won't be able to have kind of efficient algorithms. Um, so in the paper we kind of treat this uh, slightly more generally. For this talk, I just want to talk about you know kind of a standard assumption for the preferences to follow expected utility theory. Uh, so basically what this says is that I'm going to assume that every individual has kind of a utility per outcome, per deterministic outcome. So that means that I can attach a numerical quantity to, you know, how much I like the first ad, the second ad, and so forth. And then the utility from a distribution over ads is just the expectation. Sorry, uh, so the, an outcome is my piece of the outcome, or my the, an outcome is everybody's assignments <coughs> to... So in this notation, outcome is C, like C in C, that's just an add. So that's but C... The ad that I see. So yeah, so... My preferences aren't over the vector of ads that everyone sees. No. Okay. Yeah, just for, yeah, like, do you want the shampoo ad? Um, okay, so what I want to show is that when f is convex, then I can formulate the optimization problem that I had before as kind of a convex program and solve it uh, efficiently. So the argument is very simple. I want to kind of sketch it out. So what I'm going to do is kind of the straightforward thing would be to have, you know, a variable in the program for, you know, every person's outcome. So I'm going to have that. This is a vector pi of i. But I'm also going to have another vector for the fictitious allocation of i with compared to person j. Okay, so kind of this introduces an order of x squared uh, more variables. And now I'll kind of go quickly, but because uh, I want to get to the discussion. But basically, I want to argue that the preference informed fairness are constraints are linear in all of these variables. So I have to say, you know, that each one is legal, uh, kind of a legal outcome distribution. That's simple. Uh, I need to say that this uh, pi j of i is individually fair. By definition, you know, that would also be a linear constraint. And finally, I want to say that i weakly prefers pi of i over pi j of i. And from the assumption on the linearity of the preferences, that's also linear. So that's kind of a sanity check that we're not making this optimization problem significantly harder than it was with individual fairness. Um, we have a couple of more things in the paper, which I'll uh, kind of briefly mention. So I did define this for the multiple task setting. Everything I said is also for the single kind of standard uh, setting. Uh, you can also similarly use this idea to extend other notions of fairness. Uh, so we focused on individual fairness, but you can similarly do it for like group fairness notions. 
Um, and we have some discussion uh, which is important on you know, what happens to social welfare under preference informed fairness. But the idea is that kind of we don't necessarily guarantee that the social welfare will go up. Uh, but that's in line with our objective of kind of prevention, pre preventing discrimination from the objective of making everyone happy. Uh, OK, so this is the final discussion slide. So I do want to mention you know, that there are like, sources of discrimination that this model, you know, toy model, doesn't address, which is, first of all, the, pref the fact that we're assuming the preferences are known. And you know, how do you actually estimate this in practice? How do you not introduce bias there? And the second is that the outcome space is considered fixed. So again, what I said before to Alani, if, every, like, if the outcomes are off the bat bad for some parts of the population, then we don't. We don't escape this. Um, there's this, you know, question of like, ah, oh, another fairness definition. You know, do we really need this? Um, and I want to argue that the answer is yes. Uh, and really, if you think about it, you know, if we want to start incorporating these fairness constraints, and this is kind of similar to Jamie's point from before, uh, in systems that are more complex and more real world like, then we have to, like, we should be revisiting the definitions that kind of worked in these toy models and making sure that they're still doing what we want them to do. And I think in this work, we kind of put the emphasis on you know, this aspect of preferences, which if you don't incorporate it into the definitions that you're doing, you might be doing something which could be bad. And you know, there could be other interesting aspects. So I think that's a, a nice avenue for future work. Uh, and I want to end with kind of you know, also a conceptual argument for why incorporating the individual's preferences into the definition is important. Um, and this is, you know, feel free to push back, but I think that kind of at the end of the day, there's always going to be the gap between, you know, the parties that are specifying the fairness constraints and those individuals that are eventually going to be affected by them. And I think that the definitions should kind of leave some leeway for you know, individuals that maybe don't want or are not interested in whatever the fair solution that, you know, the platform thought is appropriate. Um, so I think that's kind of a nice uh, motivation for this definition. Uh, and that's it. So a couple of questions. One you just talked about about notion of fixed, um, and I think I think just best to, again the point of humanness. I think that to the extent that the assumption is that, that uh, preferences are fixed, um, we disconnect from from human reality. So that should be said um, up front. The second thing about preferences is to the extent you care about preferences. Um, Fairness could be considered as preference to begin with, right? So some people may say, well, my preference is Nazism. That's my preference. Take it into account. Is there any constraint on the type of preferences? So usually in ethics, we say we include, we incorporate some harm, harm related preferences that we don't even count. So, so some preferences, not, not all preferences are treated equally for there to be a moral justification for counting preferences to begin with. So these are just uh, broad uh, uh, um, consideration. H however, I do think that you're right in the sense that preferences matters. The question then ma matter then the question becomes a context. And what bothered me from the start was your treatment of loans and ads alike. So ads again, drawing back on yesterday's discussion, ads are manipulate persuasion to make us interested in something. Loans is something that we decide we need. It's a certain good that the question is whether we have a right to or not, it, 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 depending on all kinds of things. But this is, no, this is not at a certain, this is not similar, conceptually similar. I agree. I think it was mostly kind of to motivate the definition. So then the question becomes, in which cluster of Think choices with respect to which class of choices we should take which type of preferences and how. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm, 
Okay, so uh, as a newbie, I'm not sure I really follow the definition, so let me ask the following scenario. Suppose there is a prefer one outcome that nobody wants, like a really, really uh, annoying ad that takes a lot of computation power. If I use the, mm, the point of comparison, this um, allocation of comparison, as everyone will get to see the horrible ads that no one wants, does that make all other allocations fair now? Um, I guess it relates a little bit to Alonis, but mostly to Katrina's. You said there, you said there exists an, upper, uh, an allocation. So, the, so starting, the starting point with individual fairness is that it doesn't rule out this allocation in which everyone gets the bad outcome. You know, kind of as long as, yeah, you know. It, it, it is fair. Yeah. Right. So, so now if I want to look at, you know, starting from this allocation, uh, I don't know, now let's, give, let's choose one person and give them a good outcome. So that doesn't satisfy this definition because suppose that there are, is like one other person who is similar to this person that got the good outcome. Now they're looking at this person and they're saying, I don't prefer my current outcome over the allocation that would have satisfied individual fairness. That, does that make sense? Can we take it offline? Thank you. I think we'll have to hold yeah. further questions for lunch and further because we have now Michael Kim. Um, so